Let me remind you that we're talking in topic three about the restoration of lost truths. Nephi saw in vision that the biblical records, and I think both Old Testament and New Testament separately, were altered. That plain and precious truths were removed from the scriptures. When they were first written by the original authors, Nephi was told that they were plain and pure and precious and easy to understand. But then truths were lost, and the lost truths have blinded mankind. The blinders of our day are that truths have been lost from the Bible, and the loss is blinding people. And one of the things that the Book of Mormon does is restores those plain and precious truths. So we took a look in the last two videos at one critical doctrine that has been restored in the Book of Mormon, and that is our understanding of the fall. Today, we take a look at another one. The loss of these plain and precious truths has caused no end of harm and pain to the hearts of tender parents who have lost children. And then on top of losing a child, they were told that that child is now damned, that that child is lost forever because it wasn't baptized. That false doctrine, that lost truth has caused so much anguish over the years, so much pain, and according to the words of Mormon, couldn't be more offensive to God than to think that a child would be damned because they weren't baptized. That is an insult to God, and we'll get to that in a minute. But that lost truth has harmed so many people, and it is time that we shout from the rooftops that it is a false doctrine, and the truth needs to be proclaimed and taught, and that's what the Book of Mormon has restored. So before we get to the actual restoration of the truth and the, the verses of the Scripture, the verses of the Book of Mormon that restore that truth, I want to present what I think is one of the most tender and yet haunting scenes of the Book of Mormon. It is a clear declaration of how the Savior and the Father, by extension, feel about children. So before we talk about the doctrine of the salvation of children, and whether or not a little child is in need of baptism and repentance, let's talk about how the Savior feels about children. In 3 Nephi chapter 17, as he's approaching the end of day number one, now Jesus comes three times in 3 Nephi. He comes, leaves, comes, leaves, comes, leaves. At the end of visit number one, he's, he's, they felt the nail marks in his hands. He's taught the Sermon on the Mount. He begins by telling them that he has to go away to visit the lost ten tribes of Israel. And they begin to just show on their faces that they didn't want him to leave, but they didn't dare ask. And he's moved by compassion. And he says, is there any sick, is there anyone that's injured or harmed or lame or leprous or blind? Can I heal them? is a beautiful commentary. Can I heal them because of your faith? Think about how that applies to those of you who have wayward children or wayward friends. Jesus pleads with them, can I heal someone because of your faith? I think that's a great commentary. But after healing the multitude that were afflicted, Jesus asks for their children. Send me your children. And the children come forward and meet with the Savior. Now, what he does next is one of the most telling things about how he feels about those children. Let's read it from the record and see if you feel what I feel every single time I read it. So they brought their little children and set them down upon the ground round about him. And Jesus stood in the midst. And the multitude gave way till they had all been brought unto him. And it came to pass that when they had all been brought, Jesus stood in the midst. He commanded the multitude that they should kneel down upon the ground. And it came to pass that when they had knelt upon the ground, 
Jesus groaned within himself and said, Father, I am troubled because of the wickedness of the people of the house of Israel. He's surrounded by children and he groaned. He groaned that the adults, now this is how I see it. I picture that if Jen and I had been there and had sent some of our little children towards him, and then I heard the Savior groan over the wickedness of the house of Israel, I would hear him saying to me, Bryce, I have sent them to your house. I trust you. I love you, but I'm still worried. I'm still worried that you're not going to treat them the way you should. I hear Jesus groaning over those people who have care of these children. And he's groaning that we're not going to love them and support them and take care of them and treat them the way they need to be treated. And he's groaning over that. He's groaning over the suffering of children. Now you tell me how he feels about children. You tell me how he feels about the adults, even good adults who still aren't necessarily good enough, can we say, for these sweet, innocent children. That word preaches sermons to me about how Jesus feels about children. Now, that being said, let's hear the declared doctrine in the Book of Mormon about their salvation. Is it true that an unbaptized child is lost for eternity? Is that doctrine, as preached in so many places, a true doctrine? Well, first, let's do these sequentially. Let me walk you through the sequential chapters and point out mentions of the salvation of children. First, we turn to the angel that came to King Benjamin. If you remember that King Benjamin gathers his people, builds a tower, he's preparing to speak to the people as their king, as their prophet leader, and he prays for guidance. And in Mosiah chapter 3, an angel comes and gives him an entire chapter of instructions. The angel is speaking to King Benjamin in Mosiah chapter 3. And the angel from on high declares the following. Now, let me point out verses 14 and 15, take a brief look at them, and notice that he's speaking about the law of Moses. What the angel's about to tell King Benjamin dates all the way back to the law of Moses. This was the doctrine under the law of Moses, even when there was circumcision. This was the doctrine taught to anyone who obeyed the law of Moses. Then the angel clearly says, even if it were possible that little children could sin, they could not be saved. But I say unto you, they are blessed. For behold, as in Adam or by nature they fall, even so the blood of Christ atoneth for their sins. First of all, a little child cannot sin. It is not possible for them to sin, and even if it were possible, the atonement of Christ cleanses them. Little children don't need baptism. They don't need repentance because they are saved by Him. The angel continues in verse 18, Behold, He judgeth, and His judgment is just, and the infant perisheth not that dieth in his infancy. But men drink damnation to their own souls, except they humble themselves and become as little children. There it is. It couldn't be any more clearer, black and white, from an angel to a prophet. The infant perisheth not, that dieth in his infancy. 
Let the whole world hear that. The infant that dies in, it, in, in its infancy is not going to perish. In fact, everyone else needs to be more like that infant or they're going to perish. He goes on to say in verse 21, when that time cometh, none shall be found blameless before God, except it be little children. They can't sin. They don't perish if they die in their infancy. And when judgment day comes, they are the only ones that will be blameless unless you and I repent. If we repent, we can become like the little children, but they are the only ones that on their own, without repentance, without baptism, are blameless. That's the doctrine. Now, another one. This is Abinadi. So earlier in chronology, but later in the text, Abinadi is preaching to the priests of King Noah. And again, he's teaching them about the law of Moses and the doctrine of the law of Moses and declares in one little sentence, the doctrine of the salvation of children. He said to the priests of Noah, in Mosiah 15, verse 25, after talking about the resurrection of the righteous at the time of Christ, he then declares, and little children also have eternal life. Such a simple little sentence. But think about what that doctrine would have done for millennia had it clearly been taught and not been lost from the biblical account. Little children have eternal life. Now let's get to the rebuke of anyone who has declared that that is not true. Anyone who has declared that children would be lost if they weren't baptized or if they don't repent, anyone that would suggest to a grieving parent that their child was lost, eternally damned, because that child wasn't baptized. Let's hear the very stern rebuke from Mormon. Now, those of you familiar with the Book of Mormon knows that, know that he very rarely takes this position. Rare, very rarely is he as stern and as strong as he's being here. I think that's a commentary on this doctrine and making sure that we don't corrupt this doctrine. So we turn to one of the pivotal restorations of this truth in Moroni chapter 8. As Moroni survives his father's death and is putting together the very last few chapters of the Book of Mormon, he included one of the letters from his father, clearly foreseeing this doctrine would be taught and needs to be corrected. Moroni chapter 8. I'm just going to read large chunks of this and maybe make a few commentary, but I don't think I need to say anything. I just need to let Mormon speak. Mormon says to his son, And now, my son, I speak unto you concerning that which grieveth me exceedingly, for it grieveth me that there should be disputations rise among you. For if I have learned the truth, there have been disputations among you concerning the baptism of your little children. And now, my son, I desire that ye should labor diligently that this gross error should be removed from among you. For, for this intent have I written this apostle. Make a note of all the declarations that Mormon makes here about the, the doctrine that a child needs to repent or be baptized or it will be lost. Here he says that is a gross error and that you and I and Moroni I need to do everything we can to make sure that doesn't creep into our society. It is a gross error. He continues, For immediately after I had learned these things of you, I inquired of the Lord concerning the matter, and the word of the Lord came to me by the power of the Holy Ghost, saying, Listen to the words of Christ your Redeemer, your Lord and your God. Behold, I came into this world not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The whole need no physician, but they that are sick. Wherefore, now hear the declaration. 
This is the restored truth, and we declare it to the world. Little children are whole, for they are not capable of committing sin. Wherefore, the curse of Adam is taken from me in them, that it hath no power over them, and the law of circumcision is done away in me. After this manner did the Holy Ghost manifest the word of God unto me. Wherefore, my beloved son, I know that it is solemn mockery before God that ye should baptize little children. So, gross error, solemn mockery. I'm going to let you ponder that one for a minute. If I were to take the position that little children need to be baptized or they need to repent in order to be saved, Mormon says that is solemn mockery before God. It mocks the atoning sacrifice of his son. It mocks what he went through to save them. It is solemn mockery. He continues, you can tell Mormon feel strongly about this, right? What does that tell you about the doctrine? He continues, Behold, I say unto you that this thing shall ye teach, repentance and baptism unto those who are accountable and capable of committing sin. Yea, teach parents that they must repent and be baptized and humble themselves as their little children, and they shall all be saved with their little children. Again, do you hear Jesus groaning? Teach the parents that they need to repent so that they might be saved with their little children. And their little children need no repentance, neither baptism. Behold, baptism is unto repentance to the fulfilling the commandments unto the remission of sins. But little children are alive in Christ even from the foundation of the world. If not so, God is a partial God and also a changeable God and a respecter to persons for how many little children have died without baptism. Wherefore, if little children could not be saved without baptism, these must have gone to an endless hell. Behold, I say unto you, that he that supposeth that little children need baptism is in the gall of bitterness and in the bonds of iniquity. For he hath neither faith, hope, nor charity. Wherefore, should he be cut off while in the thought, he must go down to hell. Now, have you ever seen Mormon like this? Can you think of anywhere in the whole Book of Mormon that Mormon is writing where he is taking this strong of a position? So tell me about the doctrine and how God is impressing upon his soul the doctrine of the salvation of little children. Children don't need repentance. Children don't need baptism. And if you preach that they do, you are in the gall of iniquity. No. Nope you are in the gall of bitterness and the bonds of iniquity. And if you die in that thought, you will go where you said they need to go. Man, he is speaking with passion. And I think there's a commentary that. Just a couple more verses. For awful is the wickedness to suppose that God saveth one child because of baptism, and the other must perish because he hath no baptism. Woe be the, to them that pervert the ways of the Lord after this manner, for they shall perish except they repent. All those who remove this doctrine are going to perish if they don't repent. Now, Mormon confesses, behold, I speak with boldness. Boy, does he ever. I speak with boldness, having authority from God. For I fear not what men can do. For perfect love casteth out all fear, fear. I think there is a time and a place to be kind and to talk to people kindly. 
but there is a time and a place to make sure where we stand on this doctrine. And Mormon says, I'm not afraid to declare it boldly. Children don't need repentance. They don't need baptism. And if they die without it, they are saved because of an atonement of Christ. And anyone who believes contrary, they're the ones that need to repent because they're going to suffer if they don't. Boy, do you see the doctrine? Just a few more verses. Verse 19, little children cannot repent. Wherefore, it is awful wickedness to deny the pure mercies of God unto them, for they are all alive in him because of his mercy. He that saith that little children need baptism denieth the mercies of Christ and setteth at naught the atonement of him and the power of his redemption. Woe unto such, for they are in danger of death, hell, and an endless torment. I speak it boldly. God hath commanded me. Listen unto them and give heed, or they stand against you at the judgment seat of Christ. For behold, that all little children are alive in Christ, and also all they that are without the law. Those of you that deal with intellectually challenged people of all ages, I think that last statement applies all of these things to them as well. They are freed from the need to repent. And then let's conclude. But it is mockery before God, denying the mercies of Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit and putting trust in dead works. Behold, my son, this thing ought not to be. For repentance is unto them that are under condemnation and under the curse of a broken law. Why the repetition? Why the boldness? Why the forcefulness? Mormon doesn't speak like that in any other chapter. So may I suggest this is a critical doctrine to be restored, not just within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but everywhere our voice can send it. Children do not need to, be re need to repent. They do not need to be baptized. And to think so is solemn mockery because it denies the power of the atoning sacrifice of the Holy One of Israel. There is the restored doctrine. Would you ponder what you and I can do? A, to more faithfully take care of the precious children entrusted to us. I don't want to make the, I don't want to make the Savior groan. What can I do to more fully take care of sweet, precious children? And number two, what can we do to declare the truth, especially to broken-hearted parents who not only have lost a child, but been told that they've lost that child forever, eternally, and that child is suffering in hell. That is such a false doctrine, and it is mockery before God. Let's do all that we can to proclaim the truth and teach people that children are alive in Christ and need no such thing as baptism or repentance. It is my testimony to you that this doctrine has been boldly and powerfully restored and that we have a responsibility to get it out to the world as powerfully as it's been restored. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.